Okay, so we begin our session. Uh, so I think uh, my talk has been very made simple by our previous speaker. Um, so she has already covered what is cerebral visual impairment. So it is uh, the deficiency in the function of vision, basically something wrong with the visual pathways or processing centers in the brain, especially those posterior to the lateral geniculate body. So basically our brain does not consistently understand or interpret what the eyes see. So why is it so becoming important that we have to and have an instruction course is because, because the man improved management and survival of children affected by brain injury due to perinatal uh, insult or metabolic disease or trauma, we are rapidly seeing an increase of visual impairment in our population. So in, in our hospital itself, we've seen around 532 in the last uh, three uh, four years. And so it is emerging as one of, one of the most common cause of visual impairment among children. And it is needed that we all identify and treat these children. So we begin our IEC now um, with the first talk by Dr. Minakshi Ravindran. She's going to speak on uh, etiology and pathogenesis of CVI. Ma'am is the uh, Chief Medical Officer and the Head of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus at Arvindai Hospital, Tirunaveli. Ma'am, for your talk, please. Good afternoon. At the outset, I'd like to thank the AOS for giving us this opportunity for this IC and Dr. Suma Ganesh for including me in this talk. So I'll be talking on etiology and pathogenesis. Uh, as Madam has told, it includes all visual dysfunctions caused by damage to or malfunctioning of the retrochiasmatic visual pathways in the absence of damage to the anterior visual pathways or any major ocular disease. So the vision loss can range from mild visual impairment to complete visual deprivation. So I have divided this into two, this thing, based on the time of the insult or based on the area of the damage. So based on the time of the infant, insult, it can happen from intrauterine to anywhere up to adulthood. So in uh, early onset, it can be developmental anomalies, which I have divided into defective closure or in defective clefting or migrational anomalies or perinatal insult or in the late onset, it can be circulatory arrest or other infections. So I'll be going through each one. So we all know that the embryogenesis in the first month of the embryogenesis, the whole development of neural tube and neural tube closure, everything happens in imagination and then neural tube closure happens. So you can have in the defective closure, you can have cephalocele or defective cleavage, you can have hollow prosencephaly or defective neuronal migration, we have these defects. So coming to cephalocele, it is nothing but a extra vagination, extra uh, this thing uh, of the intracranial contents into the dura or into the skull, it is not inside, so it is outside. So you can have all these defects. It can be occipital lobe where you can have no block syndrome. Even yesterday, somebody was presenting in the session, no block syndrome. So uh, it, it will have other associated anomalies. So whenever we see any high myopia, or VR abnormalities and all those things, we should think of neuroimaging and finding out if there is any other uh, encephalocele is there. Frontoethmoidal uh, is quite common in our country, I mean in Asia. You can have an associated ipsilateral optic nerve dysplasia or nasopharyngeal encephalocele are not uncommon. They are uh, the main problem is it is because of the stretching of the optic chiasma. So once again, you will not see anything obvious when you see put a torch light or see the fundus examination, everything may be normal in these cases. So it can be de defective cleavage also, which happens in the second month of uh, embryogenesis. And you can have the various uh, abnormalities associated. The main problem being the signaling protein, which is abnormal. So yeah, you, you can have a Patau or Edwards. All these things can also be a part of the developmental anomalies. Or the neurons, usually they start migrating in the embryogenesis. 
So they migrate from the ventricular and the subventricular zones and it starts around second to fourth month and then it reaches the cortical plate. So anywhere if there is a problem, you can have this. If it is in the embryonal stage, you can have lysencephaly where they stop in the intermediate zone itself. As you can see here, it will be a very smooth brain that will be absence of cortical gyri. Whereas in pachygyria, you will have a, the migration stops at a later stage, you will have a reduced number of gyri. Whereas in polymicrogyria, you can have a multiple abnormal gyri smaller in size. Or if it happens in the fetal stage, as you can see here, there is a complete dissolution of the parenchymal uh, sac and so you can have the uh, absence of this uh, intracranial contents. So anywhere this, this thing happens, you can still have all this. The main problem which we face here as uh, the previous speaker uh, um, Sasikala was also telling, we are having this problem, poly periventricular leukomalacia, which is nothing but there is a hypoxic insult to the uh, brain. So our country is now going through a change like what we were, the early uh, ROP, this thing is happening. Now we are also uh, in the Western countries, they are uh, seeing more of uh, uh, CVI as the main cause of blindness, uh, but it is not, we are also not far behind because our preterm care is also improved very much. And so we are now showing uh, ROP uh, growth also and uh, uh, CVI growth also. So uh, as you can see here, there is a cerebral vascular autoregulation is absent in these preterm infants or early uh, term infants or low birth weight babies. So when they have an ischemic injury, they can damage the pre-myelinating oligodendrocytes. And this can lead on to diffuse gliosis or periventricular necrosis. And as you all are aware, it is mostly around the lateral ventricles and uh, the corticospinal tracts also go close to the ventricles. So whenever this damage occurs, there is the added uh, disadvantage of the child having a, a spasticity or diplegia or all the other motor anomalies because the corticospinal tract gets affected and as such all the other uh, systems so it is not a single just cerebral visual impairment as you as you know it's a full term so other anomalies are there and multiple disabilities are there in this children and uh, we should remember that the watershed zone what is the watershed zone it is the commonest area where you can have a problem because it is more prone for ischemia and this uh, ischemia and uh, uh, loss of the neurons it is the zone between the anterior and the middle cerebral and the middle and the posterior cerebral and the occipital rope is highly uh, at risk to all this hypoxia because it needs the highest amount of glucose as well as the oxygen flow so any uh, ischemia in the white matter it will result in the death of the uh, brain cells and especially the occipital lobe and uh, these are the various uh, pathways where it can get affected. Like you can see the field defect, inferior field defect, you will get when it is a posterior superior periventricular affection. Or you can have a generalized depression of the field as you see here or when the optic radiation is involved. Or increased cupping. So as you can see here, uh, 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 Dr. R.K. sir keeps telling, Dr. Ramakrishnan sir, any cup, any pallor, pallor is more than the cup, then it is not a glaucoma most probably it is some other cause. So always just don't see the cupping alone. You see the uh, disc pallor is there or not there. If the pallor is more, then we should see for other causes. Or you can have impaired visual memory. In the premature infants, the other main problem is other than hypoxia is the periventricular and the intraventricular hemorrhages and uh, where you can have the uh, bleeding within 48 hours. If it happens, you can, you can lead on to either hydrocephalus, once again, which can compress the uh, brain structures, either uh, it can be, even if you do a VP shunt, sudden decompression can cause the uh, CVI or uh, long term shunt miss uh, function. So the problem with hydrocephalus is even if you put the shunt, we should keep them on long term follow up and sometimes papilledema will not be seen even though the shunt is not functioning. So we should keep this in mind and these are the three factors how the bleeding can cause the uh, damage like uh, it can be a uh, hydrocephalus or infarction or a porencephalic cyst. The other in term infants what we have is once again uh, 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 the cerebral autoregulation is affected or it can be a perinatal infections like all these meningitis and all that can cause the problem. 
in the older children it is either circulatory arrest where uh, the basal ganglia can also be involved the other causes the previously they used to have uh, meningitis as a very common cause for uh, uh, cvi cerebrovascular uh, 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 this thing and h influenza was the most common cause and the main pathophysiology is because of the thrombophlebitis and arterial occlusion and the second most common cause was hydrocephalus these days it is much more under uh, we don't get so many cases of hydrocephalus or uh, this thing but still we do get meningitis or adem we do see these cases and here it is uh, possibly because of the hie because of the compression of the posterior cerebral arteries in hydrocephalus and we should not forget that trauma can also cause and battered baby syndrome uh, western countries is much more common but i think in the coming years we may also see some changes happening because of our culture is also sometimes changing so the other causes is hypoglycemia hemodialysis seizures infantile seizures is one important cause which we should uh, remember and nowadays hypoglycemia is quite common nowadays pediatricians or uh, neonatologists are routinely doing the blood sugar after delivery and they are uh, maintaining the sugar levels because we do see lot of cases which is missed and, and only if you get the history out we will get this so based on the area of the damage i won't go into the details the mainly two pathways other than the just occipital cortex and uh, this is the tree of vision i think the next speakers will be uh, talking in detail so these are the four areas we should con based on the area of damage it can be the dorsal stream or the uh, ventral stream and the temporal lobe or the middle temporal lobe or the visual uh, occipital lobe so when the uh, uh, occipital lobe is involved which has the maximum uh, highest blood flow you can have all this impaired visual fields visual acuity contrast sensitivity and the stereopsis and when you have the middle temporal lobe which is involved you have the akinetopsia absolute or relative that is they won't be able to see when the object is still but when it is moving they can pick it up and uh, when it is the ventral stream that is the what pathway and uh, when you have the ventral stream that is uh, involved you are it impairs your conscious vision and uh, the visual recognition and memory so face as prosopagnosia or topographic agnosia can be there and uh, in the dorsal stream it is the posterior parietal lobe which is mainly involved and all this this functions can be there so we have also have a publications and uh, we also have seen around more than 120 cases and uh, once again perinatal hypoxic episode is the most common and followed by prematurity and structural abnormalities so summarize always try to avoid its prevention is always better than cure so avoid all these intrauterine infections neonatal hypoxia all that so how do we prevent a preterm delivery is better care of antenatal care by preventing uh, taking care of the diabetes hypertension and all that it will prevent these are my references and i would like to acknowledge sabha sachi and pramina sham for helping me with the presentation thank you I think we have our keynote speaker here. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I mean, we keep your next talk then after this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She is. Uh, I mean, I'll introduce her, Dr. Nihal Adil Hassan. She is a professor of ophthalmology, Cairo University, Egypt, and we're happy to have her here. Uh, she is owner of El Hassan Diagnostic Eye Center. She'll be speaking on sonar in pediatric ophthalmology. I think uh, I'll speak first, and then maybe we give her the opportunity to speak. Um, so um, the topic which I'll be speaking is, I think it's a maybe a repetition of Dr. Elizabeth, uh, um, Dr. Shashi Kala. So, but I'll just go in brief. So, uh, what are the ophthalmic manifestations and assessments in cerebral visual impairment? So basically, we have three stations: the occipital lobe, posterior parietal lobe, and temporal lobe, and that is very important for us to understand. So most of the cases, we do get an MRI, which will be our uh, one of the topic where we'll say how does MRI correlate with our higher visual deficits. So uh, she's again mentioned about uh, testing of visual acuity, color, contrast sensitivity, and visual fields in all children with CVI. and there are um, um, instruments or to measure these important things for checking the uh, occipital lobe uh, functions so damage to the occipital lobe will cause poor clarity 
that they may be inability to perceive colors and uh, there will be less contrast and visual field deficits. So less contrast is very important to check, especially in children with CVI, because the rehabilitation person will have to be told that the child has a low contrast or how much of the contrast is not there, so that to further plan the rehabilitation session. So uh, station two is the posterior parietal lobe. As it's mentioned that there are two streams, the dorsal stream and the ventral stream. The dorsal stream connects the occipital area with the posterior parietal cortex. And so it tells us everything like a where. So you analyze the visual scene and give attention to the object of interest with the posterior parietal cortex lobe. So, um, so this is how we get the visual guidance of body movements and uh, for everything in the development of the child. These things are so important because uh, this, if our posterior parietal lobe is damaged, most of the things our developmental gets hampered. So how do we check it uh, in the OPD is also very important. And they will also have problems in like differentiating things because they have inability to process multiple visual objects in the surrounding. And that is what a child initially fears because when they go very when they are put with so many objects and then the fear starts. And this is called as simultaneousia. And low visual imp field impairment is something which we see very common. And most of the parents say that like my child does not see the inferior field and therefore bumps into objects or into any obstacle. So this is because superior optic radiation serving the lower visual fields, they pass through the posterior parietal lobes. So this is affected. And there also is an impaired visual guidance of movement, which is called as optic ataxia. So now you see a child, it's a simple Lea puzzle which should be in forming a part of the armamentarium now or for a pediatric ophthalmologist. We can't say we cannot have this. Uh, so this is a child with right hemiparesis and he is struggling to um, because of the eye-hand coordination problems. And he's not aware of the directions and these are problems of children with brain damage, even in, with mild uh, brain damage. So we should do these tests if we are having a doubt and find out how much of the cognition problem is there to identify to the uh, rehabilitation expert. And so this is optic ataxia, which is called as impaired visual guidance or movement. It looks simple. Uh, which we all, I think, make our child play when our children are small, but it helps us to identify the problem. Then has, she's already showed you the Leah box, uh, Leah mailbox, and this is a child who is asked to drop a card through the slot of the Leah mailbox game, and then he would properly tell you about the perception, oh, it's, uh, it's tilted the image, it tell you it's passed the slot correctly to the orientation of the slot by turning the card in the correct position, but if you see the child with CVI, he will not be able to do the simple task. So this is this things we have made in the OPD with a simple card. We do not need to have big, big uh, things uh, because most of the things are expensive. But these simple tests tells us that there is optic ataxia, there is impaired visual guidance to movement, and all these help us in identifying the Lea. Uh, the, so the ventral stream also it helps us in recognizing this connects the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe, it helps us in recognizing color, shapes, objects. So this has been covered by the previous speaker. So now how do we do the eye examination and uh, how do we say that this is CVI and uh, not uh, OVI? So because now CVI is a big term covering a range of visual difficulties, ranging from profound visual impairment to low functioning CVI to near normal um, visual acuity. So you have to correlate, like what we find is that uh, on the, if you see the visual examination, you find that the ocular findings do not visually explain to you the visual difficulties of the child's or the parents. So once you come to know that, okay, this child is 636 and I'm not finding anything which is, uh, you know, which is telling me that what is the reason for the 636, why there is suboptimal vision. And then I look at the disc and I see, oh, there's a, a temporal pallor. And let, then I investigate further, do an MRI and find out, okay, now there is, there has has been an insult to the brain and now how do I proceed? So this is how uh, you have to pick it up. There may be a latency for visual response. So all these small, small tips like a visual attention span, difficulty with crowded visual information, light gazing behavior, all these things help us to pick up, of course, a child. So a normal child uh, uh, will be one who at the same age has a squint but will be able to reach out to objects even though there is a squint. So this is ocular visual impairment and the child will be able to look and pick up the object. But you see a similar child who is not responding to anything, does not look at the uh, torch or at the light, 
now no contact see you have a drum the child is not at all attentive to it so then this is a child with cvi so this is how you will uh, start uh, referring the children and saying that this is not uh, ovi but this is cvi then you'll have a child with so you may have delayed milestones like a uh, 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 or the child will just light gaze or non purposeful gaze so um, these the head holding is not there so these all delayed milestones maybe the the pediatrician itself has not even told the parents that they need to go to an ophthalmologist or to a pediatric ophthalmologist or to an early intervention specialist so you may have to guide the parents to them okay now you need to go to an early intervention specialist this is not normal so uh, there may be field preferences so you can do uh, the lia wand is there Uh, so but we have we use a simple white board and then we show the objects a simple puppet toy and ask see where the child is preferring to look at so if there is an inferior field defect we will write and give to the therapist that okay there is a field defect maybe in this gaze and uh, left gaze and the right gaze or in the inferior field so all this information we need to give to the therapist so that they can work on those fields and they can improve those fields of the child so there you can also have children like like this who we have operate i have operated for cataract but still has not is not performing well so then uh, only with the sound the child is responding so it is very slow in looking at the object so you have operated you feel that okay now i have done it's one month past a few glasses have been given why is not the child responding is difficulty in viewing in a complex environment so what to do so in that we have to refer so they also have a color preference so this we use in rehabilitation red and yellow are the most commonly preferred colors because they have the longest wavelengths so we can use these simple toys like sometimes you can just use a glaze paper with a red in the torch you can put a glaze paper red or a yellow and you can stimulate so children who are not at all fixing and following light you can tell the parents you start with this if they are staying far away or they are not able to come to a therapist and that itself stimulates the brain to see so uh, this so why it is important to identify the features because these visual functions can be easily overcome by simple environmental modification uh, dr shashikla just showed in her video how by simple simple techniques they were doing the early intervention therapy you do not need big big instruments or big big things only the child has to be taught them because the child is not going to learn by him oneself so we need as parents as um, as uh, uh, clinicians to tell them okay you show them these toys you keep on uh, uh, identifying these toys throw light at the child so this is how we need to improve their fixation so now always the parents were uh, after us like okay i have brought my child i don't see any improvement so how do we check improvement so this is what is done by the therapist the early intervention therapist so they measure the cvi range so there is like uh, three cards like 0 uh, o y, i and d where the information is through the observation of the child o and i is information obtained through interview and uh, direct information by direct contact with the child so we can do it the covid has taught us that you can even do it through telecommunication and that's how we measure like what is the child not able to fix so that this cards are available on the net this has been developed by roman and uh, lancy and this has uh, this you can say okay now your child is in range 1 or 2 now the child can be improved to 5 6 or to 7 8 and that is how you will or if it is resolved you will write r so you will mention whether there is a right gaze or a left gaze where where the and the child is not following so there is this type they may be wandering moments the child is sedated so all these things you have to mention in your chart so this is when the child comes to 7 to 8 range you feel that okay the treatment has been successful which may take one year or two years so vision assessment is the same but we use i think she's already mentioned about the lia pedal uh, lia pedal is important because most of the neurologist or the uh, you know or the therapist want us to measure vision so that is how we measure the vision with the help of the lia pedal chart because the child uh, needs to be you know, like you cannot so most of them are like one cycle per second or two cycles per second or three cycles per second you do not get more so in to improve them further and further so we need to uh, tell uh, show them the uh, the i'll be just taking another two minutes so the other uh, this is refraction which is common has what we the glasses what we give it in uh, other normal children Uh, so we need to give glasses to all these children we can't say that most of the parents say chashma will their child will not wear the glasses but it's important that we make the child wear glasses because that is the important thing will make them fix and follow light and also help them to improve when we are stimulating the brain so the therapist always advises okay you need to give the glasses
The accommodative status is most important in children, but most of these children, you need to do a dynamic retinoscopy, as mentioned earlier, that we need to check for the lack of accommodation because these children, everything is nearby. Everything you're wanting, wanting to do is nearby. So if the child is not able to see for near, then you have a problem. So if, you're, if your child is improving, you can see that when you give a plus three or a plus four ad and the child starts focusing at near, it is important to give the ad glasses. So these glasses are very important because 57% of children have, these, uh, have accommodative lags. The contrast is very important to do. The contrast sensitivity test is also very important. This is our Heidi test. So this helps us that whether there is 5% or uh, 10% loss or 100% loss. And this is important to tell the parent because in uh, rehabilitation, we need to improve the contrast. But maybe the child is not able to see clearly because of the poor contrast. So um, neuroophthalmic manifestations have been covered nicely. And there will be a talk on strabismus and CVI. I just want to say that we have done a small project in Vrindavan Mathura and I hope all of you aim towards these projects. Uh, there are many like we are working with Perkins International. I think CBM is also very keen. We have to sensitize the communities because these children are just lying down in the communities and waiting for help. None of them are coming to, the, uh, coming to us for help. So we need to identify these children with uh, disabilities. There are a lot of grant funds available. We need to screen and assess them. There are CBR workers who have been trained by CBM and Perkins. And we need to help them by learning educational and therapy interventions. There are a lot of facilities given by the government. Uh, there is training and capacity building for training these community rehabilitation workers. There is such a Shiksha Abhyan and a Samar Samagra Shiksha Abhyan, which is working on these children. And they're willing to give them disability certificates and also um, give them a they can help them with providing them with all appliances because that is a problem which comes in these children that they require appliances so we need to uh, help them with that they may not be aware you need to evaluate the progress and the uh, evaluation of these children so documentation is important you need to give them support for aids and appliances glasses need-based nutrition support and school enrollment for inclusive education. So all this we need to complete the loop and as pediatric ophthalmologist, it is our duty, it is our moral value that we help these children not only just by surgeries but also by providing them education and training. I mean that's very very important. So you will not believe these were the numbers which we seen. We seen 368 children which were hidden in Mathura district and we help these children. So it is not a small number we need to help them and it is my sincere request to all of them, pediatric ophthalmologists, please screen and there is help, there are a lot of provision provided by the government also. So we can give them at least some support, some interventions and help them uh, cover and you can also give them a disability certificate. Thank you. So uh, the... Um, uh, I hope any questions we can cover. I'm just be any questions that you have. You need to know what to do for these children. If you want any help, we can provide that help because uh, our aim is in during the instruction course is to identify these children and help them. Priya, you can uh, take the uh, dice there. So our uh, next speaker we have on um, uh, speaking will be speaking on which I have not covered is basically the correlation of higher visual deficits with MRI imaging. We have Dr. Priya Goyal here. She works, she is a consultant at Dr. Shroff Charity Eye Hospital. She will be covering this topic and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Suma Ganesh. I am very grateful to you for providing me this wonderful opportunity. So I'll talk about the correlation of higher visual deficits with MRI imaging. So before that, we first have to understand the importance of the same. So this is a three years old child who presented to us at one of our secondary centers with a visual impairment and also associated motor problems, hand-eye coordination problems, perceptual skills problems. So she was not even able to grasp the objects properly or sit properly. And uh, what she was uh, recognized as by her peers was mentally impairment. But when she presented to us, what we found was that she was suffering from cerebral visual impairment, which was confirmed on MRI as well. And according to the specific areas involved in her brain, we could provide her specific uh, occupational as well as uh, rehabilitation therapy. And she's doing better now. So uh, CVI, that is cerebral visual impairment, the definition itself tells us which are the areas affected. So it is basically deficit in the visual function associated with damage to the retrochiasmatic 
visual pathways and cerebral structures in the absence of major ocular disease. And these visual function deficits can be in the form of visual impairment, visual field impairment or difficulties in the higher order visual spatial processing. And these can occur even in the presence of normal or near normal visual acuity, which precludes further the uh, diagnosis of cerebral visual impairment. That's why there is a need for improved accuracy in diagnosing, assessing and developing effective education and rehabilitation. So these function deficits, how they occur and what kind of deficits can occur, that depends upon the cause, location and the extent of cerebral insult. These lesions can not only just occur in the primary visual cortex, but they can occur in different pathways and cortical areas of the developing brain of the child. And it is therefore important to know the history of the child that whether the child was born at term or whether it was born at prematurity. So in a preterm child, we have to look for the areas around the dorsal as well as lateral to the external angle, angle of the lateral ventricles where we can see the PVL changes in which are the result of hemorrhagic necrosis of the white matter around these areas. Whereas in a term child, we will find hypoischemic encephalopathy related changes, especially in the areas of deep gray matter, hippocampus, brainstem and thalamus. So whether it is a term or a preterm child, basically the insult is hypoxia, which causes a necrosis of the myelinated as well as pre-myelinated fibers, which causes, because the demand of the brain is more as, well, as compared to the supply. So that obstructs the normal development of the white matter pathways that communicates between the sensory and motor areas, which causes the motor and cognitive impairments. We have been talking about these two pathways. Let's understand which are the areas involved in these pathways because this is important to know where, where, uh, where to look at the MRI imaging to look for the damage in the brain lesions. So this is a two stream hypothesis, which one is the dorsal and one is the ventral. Dorsal is the where stream, which is responsible for the spatial processing. And it is comprising of superior longitudinal fasciculus that comes, that connects the occipital lobe to the posterior parietal lobe and ends at the frontal lobe. The ventral pathway is responsible for the object processing, that is the what stream, and it is comprising of inferior longitudinal fasciculus. Both of these are interconnected with the help of inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. The inferior longitudinal fasciculus is connecting the occipital lobe to the temporal lobe. So can we visualize these areas on imaging as well or not? Because these are the lesions we are looking for. So yes, with the advanced imaging technologies, which is the Hardy, that is the white matter reconstruction by high angular resolution diffusion based imaging, we can do the same. So this is the normal uh, person's brain on the Hardy imaging, where we can see all the dorsal, ventral, as well as the IFIF lesion uh, pathways. Whereas in patients with CVI, these pathways are not reconstructed and they are missing on the scan. So what are the visual functions which we are trying to correlate with the MRI? These are four major uh, functions, which is visual attention, visual perception, visual cognition, and visual guidance of the movement. Uh, we can assess these with the help of questionnaires. We have been talking about the questionnaires since uh, the morning presentations. Uh, now trying to correlate them with the MRI findings, it's a very complex task and not fully understood even in the literature. Many of the authors have tried earlier in their studies to correlate the uh, higher visual functions with the gross cerebral uh, morphological changes on standard imaging technologies. Though so Sir Dargolu et al. found that there was a, a correlation of low severity of PVL changes with the minor motor problems and mild to moderate function uh, outcomes, as well as when there was a severe uh, mod mod developmental delay, it was correlated to the cortical atrophy and thinning of the corpus callosum. However, these standard technologies cannot uh, 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 ascertain the uh, underlying microarchitectural damage to the key white matter pathways. That's why we need advanced technologies in the form of diffusion-based imaging, that is the diffusion tensor imaging, or the white matter tractography, or the Hardy. So authors have tried these imaging technologies as well to correlate the visual functions. And Lenartson et al., they found that the diffusion-weighted MRI correlated white matter damage predominantly in the superior posterior periventricular white matter with the documented visual dysfunction. How they also found that early injury to the optic radiations was associated with the characteristic patterns of the visual field deficit. But the same was not seen by the Gazetta at all. They found that even in the presence of early periventricular damage, 
uh, ventricular damage to the optic radiations, there was a normal development of the visual field function. They suggested that the preservation of visual field function probably was the result of compensatory neuroplastic reorganization. Ugetti et al. Uh, found a direct co correspondence between the MR alterations in the path of optic radiations and significant functional deficit. They found uh, specific uh, areas to be considered while looking for an MRI scan, that is the visual pathways, the pyramidal fibers, and the geniculocalcarine tracts. The latest technology which is considered to be the superior of all is the Hardy that was studied by Boer et al. They found the individuals with CVI to have dramatic reductions in the volume as well as the number of fibers of the ILF, SLF and the IFOF. Surprisingly, they also found that these fibers were intact even in the patients with ocular blindness. So probably we can differentiate between ocular as well as cerebral visual impairment. Now, what kind of uh, uh, lesions can be seen on the images? So it can be in the form of diffuse cerebral atrophy or bioccipital lobe infarctions or periventricular leukomalacia, cerebral dysgenesis or parieto-occipital and parasagittal watershed infarctions. So uh, on the uh, normal scan, we can see high signal changes on T2-weighted images, which are suggestive of hypoxic ischemic injury, especially in the areas of parasagittal cortex and deep gray matter. On diffusion-weighted imaging, these can be even picked up earlier in the form of uh, hyperintensity, which are suggestive of restricted diffusion in the in injured tissues. Cortical lesions can be seen uh, as in the, seen in the picture, that there can be optic radiations involved uh, along the contiguous enlargement of the uh, posterior ventricle and corticospinal pathways. Also, in the subcortical lesions, we can see reduction in the white matter or uh, increased signal intensity or abnormal incre abnormally increased signal intensity in the white matter along with the irregular outlines of the lateral ventricles along with the dilatation. They can also be decreased volume later on with the increased signal, uh, signal within the thalami bilaterally, suggestive of atrophic changes as well. Sioni et al. also tried to correlate the structural and functional abnormalities. So they found maximum damage to the optic radiations and the visual cortex, uh, more so in the optical radiation, and also PVL lesions were constantly seen. They tried to correlate the global Dutton's questionnaire with the amount of visual impairment, the motor outcomes, as well as the MRI findings. findings. However, they could just correlate the visual impairment with the questionnaire and not the rest of the things. But the visual impairment was definitely correlated with the MRI findings. So they found the further changes in the MRI, which was in the form of ventricular dilation with irregular outlines, irregular signal intensity, reduced white matter in PVL regions, cystic lesions, widening of the subarachnoid lesions, lesions at thalamus or basal ganglia, and dystrophy of the corpus callosum. So no impairment was seen when optic radiations were seen on the axial or coronal planes. Moderate impairment was seen when areas of abnormal signals were hiding the optic radiations and especially near the ventricular walls. And severe impairment was seen when areas of abnormal signals also involved the surrounding white matter. Uh, some of the authors have tried to correlate the semi-quantitative MRI scale with the uh, brain lesions and this uh, found the three summary scores in the form of global, hemispheric and subcortical uh, lesions. So they found that the cortical lesions were basically the occipital lobe damage, subcortical lesions were the thalami and the posterior limb of the internal capsule and corpus callosum and cerebellum, they did not show any correlation whereas the global and mean hemispheric scores were co strongly correlating with all the visual function parameters. They suggested that visual acuity, visual field, stereopsis, and color impairment seem to be linked with the cortical damage, whereas the motility disorder, ocular motility disorders were strictly linked to the subcortical damage. In our study also, uh, which was published in JPOS in 2019, we also found that the main involvement was of the dorsal stream followed by the periventricular region, uh, region and corpus callosum followed by the uh, ventral stream. And the most common type of damage which was seen was in the form of ischemia followed by encephalomalacia and later on gliosis, atrophic demyelinating changes or the hemorrhagic changes were seen. So the take home message as my conclusion slide will be the need that we have, there is a need to be more vigilant uh, in the history taking and patient assessment of a CBI children. We need to request for specific MRI scans so that we can correlate with the visual function impairment which we have documented in that child. And we should ourselves be vigilant also to uh, uh, see the lesions that which area is being involved so that we can guide our rehabilitation treatment accordingly. Thank you.
Thank you, Priya, for uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, now, uh, we have, we are very fortunate to have a keynote speaker amongst us, uh, Dr. Nihal Ayasan. She is the professor of ophthalmology from Cairo University. And uh, she'll be speaking on uh, ultrasonography in pediatric ophthalmology. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, dear colleagues, uh, good uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to thank the scientific committee for uh, this kind invitation. It's always a great pleasure for me to join in all India uh, meetings uh, every year, and uh, to my great pleasure. Uh, to, uh, I, as we all know, the uh, pediatric age group, these are challenging cases to reach to the proper diagnosis, especially uh, posterior uh, retinal and uh, optic nerve assessment and visual rehabilitation uh, and visual assessment for further visual rehabilitation as in the previous uh, uh, very uh, nice excellent talks uh, the aim of my presentation is uh, to illustrate some of the posterior ocular abnormalities and pathology that uh, we meet in children especially in media opacity and uh, uh, for proper assessment of the posterior uh, pole uh, I used the 10 megahertz probe longitudinal and transverse scans were done uh, uh, not only to assess and measure the axial length of the globe which is important to know the growth and the development of uh, the globe in infancy and newly born, uh, but to detect uh, many of the uh, congenital anomalies and ocular pathology, which are very common in the first one year of the, uh, in the pediatric age group. Uh, as we all know, the persistence of the hyaloid canal and the persistent permixture papilla, whether to see it just a very small prepapillary fibrosis, pyramidal in shape projecting in the vitreal cavity, or to be in the mid vitreal cavity with scattered vitreal opacities, or extending even to the posterior pole of uh, the crystalline lens uh, with dense opacification. And this is very important, especially in the presence of uh, uh, congenital cataract, posterior polar cataract, if there is patency of this hyaline uh, artery and hyaline canal, or it might present even with, as, as this example, with vitreous uh, hemorrhage uh, and uh, should be further uh, assessed. A uh, small globe with the uh, dense opacification, pyramidal in shape, which is the persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous, which is uh, very common, especially in unilateral leukocoria, and uh, to be differentiated from ROP, which uh, uh, is uh, very important to be uh, uh, very common in bilateral condition, usually uh, an eye preceding the other with fractional retal detachment and funnel shaping with retro renta dense fibrosis in the uh, vitreal cavity. Uh, and to go for large globe, a large globe with a uh, long uh, axial uh, length uh, to first, uh, uh, we uh, very common to see the optic nerve with the cupping, the classic cupping in abophthalmos, uh, and usually is very obvious, and to differentiate it with the irregular excavation of the optic nerve head in optic nerve disc hypoplasia and uh, coloboma. Uh, or it is uh, associated with excavation of the choroid uh, below, usually in the infranasal, according to the embryological fissure of the development, embryological development of the globe, uh, in associating a choroidal uh, coloboma as well, with or without the posterior uh, hyaloid uh, uh, would be persistent. Uh, and the irregularity, the severe extensive irregularity in the posterior uh, pole with the extensive choroidal and uh, optic nerve uh, disc uh, coloboma to be differentiated from a large myopic anisometropic globe with the smooth posterior staphyloma of the globe. And uh, this is another case with optic nerve head coloboma with smooth colobomatous optic nerve head, but associated with inferior uh, detachment and a case of complicated cataract associating this case. Uh, uh, another example, a microphthalmic globe with irregularity at the posterior uh, uh, part of the globe at the optic nerve head shadow with uh, even this continuity of the optic nerve head a hypoplasia and uh, uh, optic nerve head coloboma. Uh, nanophthalmic eye, which is less than 15 millimeter, we have uh, many of these cases presenting with choroidal coloboma, and this might be 
even an orbital cyst uh, communicated or not communicated to the optic nerve uh, head behind uh, the uh, in the retrobulbar uh, space and this is another case of the nanophthalmos we have a multiple abnormality in an eye the right eye showing uh, persistence of the posterior pri of the primary hyperplastic primary vitreous with irregularity in the optic nerve head and the left eye showing an orbital cyst associating the optic nerve hypoplasia and even a cryptophthalmos but sorry, I lost the sonar for this case, which was important. That I used the sonar to assess if the globe is uh, uh, can be differentiated globe or not to uh, do anything for that uh, uh, poor uh, child. Uh, in cases with uh, traumatic cataract with the dense media opacity, I can differentiate. Of course, it's very important for the surgeon to see if there is intraocular foreign body in cases of penetrating injuries, associating vitreous hemorrhage, to be differentiated from leukocoria, a case of uh, uh, the different causes of leukocoria, especially retinoblastoma with the, uh, 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 the pathognomonic calcification and the irregular homogeneity of the uh, uh, retinal mass. Uh, and if it's associating a dense uh, vitreal uh, condensation of uh, intravitreal dis uh, uh, dispersion of uh, this advanced retinoblastoma. In cases of complicated cataract with uveitis and this uh, child with uh, Harada, Vogt-Kanagi Harada syndrome, and uh, to see what's uh, as the assessment of the posterior hyaloid with partial posterior uh, vitreal attachment to the uh, irregular elevated optic nerve had due to uh, uh, previous attacks of uh, uh, posterior veitis with uh, neuroretinitis, uh, as well as in clear, even in clear media, where I can photograph the fundus of the child, but we need the sonar to give two-dimensional scanning of these cases, as in that case, the, 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 he was referred to me to, for irregularity in the optic nerve head, and the uh, very obvious choroidal, isolated choroidal coloma behind, uh, the sonar showed irregular elevation in the uh, optic nerve head with the, just its remnant of uh, the posterior permixer papilla and the posterior hyaloid attachment uh, rudimentary part of it, and with a very shallow choroidal, inferior choroidal coloboma. Uh, this case with optic nerve uh, disc uh, swelling, uh, it's very important for the child to do the first thing, ultrasonography, to exclude the possibility of optic disc drusen, which is very common and uh, goes. we'll go for a dilemma of neurological assessment of that child, and simply it's optic nerve head drusen. But it's not simple because, as you all know, that optic disc drusen should uh, do, go for neurological and endocrinological assessment because there are many abnormalities in these children uh, regarding the uh, corpus callosum. And to uh, do if he's a child that can be cooperative on the visual field, we should do him visual field because this uh, drusen will enlarge by time and will compress the uh, uh, nerve fiber layer and will lead to a visual uh, def deficit for this child, but at least to know that he's going for an optic disc drusen. It might be as that which ha high echogenicity, or it can might might be even embedded inside the optic nerve head as in this condition and not that much elevated uh, disc. Uh, uh, even uh, if uh, here I, it was only for sonar, then for my interest uh, in this sonar is only elevated disc which I can't go for uh, optic disc edema, but as well, there is nothing uh, uh, significant that I can correlate clinically. And it's a clear media, but the child was not cooperative with the pediatrician to, uh, or with the ophthalmic pediatrician to uh, examine. I uh, took simple photography with a narrow pupil that I can use on my fundus camera, and it's a dense myelinated uh, uh, nerve fiber layer, uh, which uh, uh, gave a uh, grayish reflex that it was uh, disturbing uh, the uh, clinician. So uh, ultrasound for ocular scanning is very essential, complementary for the diagnosis uh, of the clinical examination cases, especially for uh, to detect the ocular pathology, especially if the child is very young, uncooperative ch child, with, which is more convenient for uh, the child and uh, more safe 
to uh, try to do ultrasonography instead of examination under anesthesia in these cases, uh, uh, especially if narrow pupil, and it's two-dimensional to detect any underlying lesion, uh, detachment, or intraocular masses, and reproducible for the follow-up of that child. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, ma'am, for an excellent presentation. Any questions to ma'am, please? So uh, another diagnostic, so has ma'am finished the, uh, the talk on uh, sonar and pediatric ophthalmology? Yes, it was very helpful. Thank you. Um, we go to the next prognostication or the next diagnostic. Oh, you have a question? Sorry. Uh, in case of a gold heart syndrome, have you experienced uh, optic nerve drusen? A gold heart syndrome is a condition which is characterized by congenital limbal dermite with preauricular skin tag and appendage. In literature, I have seen about four or five cases of gold heart syndrome, which are basically normal from visual and optic nerve point of view. Because 80 to 85 percent cases are normal. It's only in 10 to 50 percent cases that you get additional congenital defects like large palate, defects in the kidney, congenital heart, defects in the dental anomalies, they are uh, impairment of the memory. And uh, just because I think you are a pediatric ophthalmologist, I am also a pediatric ophthalmologist. Do you have experience in the case of an optic nerve drusen in Golden Heart Syndrome? I didn't meet. Sorry? In, in my experience, I didn't meet a golden heart with optic nerve had drusen. Golden what I want to say is that uh, I also have not seen, but in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, 1968, Mittal et al. reported three cases of optic nerve drusen with gold heart syndrome. Mm -hmm. Gold heart syndrome, you have about 17 families which are in Greece. There are golden heart syndrome support groups. Children born in Middle East during Gulf War and military hospitals have a high incidence of gold heart syndrome. It's Mittal et al. If you see in general ophthalmology, in 1968, it reported three cases of ordinary drusen associated with gold heart syndrome. It's Thank very you. nice. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, for sir, the... very much. Yes, sir. we should. He, what I think what he's saying is that we need to. Uh, look carefully when we see a uh, golden heart syndrome maybe we should also investigate for uh, optic nerve drusen uh, so we have next is um, dr sahitya she will be speaking on uh, she is the um, uh, consultant at where she said arvind eye hospital uh, madurai so uh, she's also a pediatric ophthalmologist she will be speaking on progno vp in prognostication of cvi um, I think this is very important because most of the time the parents ask us for uh, to give the prognosis of the vision in children and uh, she has done intensive work in this aspect and uh, let's hear from her how does she help us all to how to uh, prognosticate children with uh, CVI. Thank you. Thank you ma'am. Good afternoon. At the outset I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for the opportunity. So I'll be talking on visual evoked potentials and their role in cerebral visual Im impairment. Just a broad overview of VEP, what it does is it facilitates the determination of quality and speed of processing of the visual stimulus. Whenever there's a visual stimulus, it goes from the retina to the primary visual cortex, so the striate cortex, the Broadman area 17 and V1, where there are electrical impulses that are generated. The VEP just picks on this electrical impulses that are generated at this cortical level. So this is the only objective technique that you have to clinically assess the functional state of the eye. And the latency and amplitude are the common parameters that we use. So what is the role of uh, VEP here in CVI? You know CVI as such children with CVI it is very difficult to and challenging to assess any uh, visual acuity or uh, any other measure. So uh, doing a VEP you will know what the functional state of the eye is. But VEP has certain prerequisites, two of which are a fixation accuracy. For the amplitude and a good waveform in the VEP for you to reliably interpret, you need fixation accuracy. And whatever um, electrical impulses and activity that comes from the striate and extra striate is mostly from the central field or the central retina. 
these are prerequisites for any decent VEP for it to be reliable and that's exactly the problem when it comes to CVI because in children with CVI you cannot bank on central vision all the time they might have a larger use of peripheral vision their fixation is poor sometimes they might have eccentric fixation a lot of blinks face turns and fidgetings might be there they'll have poor attention you might not be able to make them sit and stare at the screen to get a VEP even if you make them sit and get a VEP there's another fundamental problem which is VEP is not vision in its true sense it is only a correlate of vision it only picks on the electrical signals it does not tell you how a child sees so it does not measure the functional vision or the functional visual capacity which includes contrast sensitivity it might say that the child has so much vision but what the child sees you really don't know and it's highly non-specific when there are higher processing difficulties meaning when the child has to transform and process the impulses CVI has a lot of difficulty surrounding these areas which VEP might lose out on. Having said that, uh, the other way that you would look for vision in these children is preferential looking tests. So the difference between VEP and preferential looking is that preferential looking also takes into account the attention and ocular motor abilities and gives you a functional vision meaning what does a child see in natural circumstances and hence that is why we always go in for preferential looking tests to see if a child is able to see or not so much discouraging VEP then why VEP at all why is there so much research around VEP if we know that there is no reliable thing coming out because most research now suggests that in a pattern reversal VEP the amplitude of P1 positively correlates to visual equity and spatial contrast sensitivity if adequate range of spatial frequencies are used for testing and also the quantitative discrepancy whenever a child's vision is taken by a preferential looking test and a sweep VEP is done if the discrepancy between the VEP and your preferential looking is within one octave it is normal it does not tell you anything but if it is more than one or more octaves it might be a biomarker for CVI and it might mean that this child has CVI. So what type of VEP will uh, we be choosing? They tried with flash VEPs but basically flash VEPs don't tell you anything. Um, it may be a subcortical phenomenon when you see from flash so it does not work so now it is not used. Pattern revoked by visual potentials they show good sensitivity and specificity. The most important point is that even subtle dysfunctions in preterm children at the time of birth can be detected by pattern evoked vision potentials and this will go a long way in prognosticating how the vision will develop in these children. In spastic cerebral palsy where children have difficulty in visual motor dysfunction meaning transforming a visual impulse into a motor act where there is a problem with that VEP will always help you bring out the vision and longitudinal assessment of visual function to see how the child catches up with vision. Now also they have tried to do parietal and occipital responses where they have put electrodes in multiple topographic areas on the scalp whereby they, they can also record the parietal responses and when there is a different uh, discrepancy between the parietal response and occipital response this can again mean that the child has CVI. Spatial contrast and spatial frequency. The spatial contrast sensitivity and response amplitudes are very very specific for CVI and contrast is something which is strongly affected in CVI. So this is uh, an important prognostic factor for CVI where contrast thresholds significantly correlate with age among those who had measurable thresholds and contrast also improves with age in CVI. So when you do longitudinal assessments and see that the contrast spatial sensitivity is improving it means that the child will also improve with vision however there is no such correlation with spatial frequencies again vernier acuity is always better than grating uh, uh, vep acuities and this again is more affected in children with cvi so how does vep predict cvi the sweep vep gives you a better acuity than preferential looking tests so whenever you do in more than the plt the sweep vep will have values and eventually the child grows on to attain the levels of sweep PEP sometimes they even get better vision than that so once you have something like that you can reliably prognosticate that this child will have uh, will grow into have a better vision and now as a recent advance they have uh, started using Gaussian functions 
to extrapolate CVP spatial fre uh, frequency and to make it a marker of CVI. However, all said and done, you'll have to make them sit for the test. So the primary problem still remains. Now the uh, things that they've started to do is that you can always limit the time of stimulus to maintain attention span. All of us know that CVI children have a very small attention span. So step VEPs where there is a limited time span of stimulus, alternate methods of stimulus presentation. Instead of giving all these pattern checker bo uh, boxes, they've tried uh, SLO, VR headsets and glasses, which will directly transmit the impulse to the retina. A lower luminance, many children will do much better when there is a lower luminance, especially with CVI. A comfortable position, maybe recommend positions help. An augmented sensory uh, like background music or something which calms down the child. And the other extra striated cortex, the dorsal and ventral streams like everybody has been talking about, they modulate the occipital electrical activity to a large extent and the functional vision also depends on these extra striated uh, cortices. So with typical um, targets, we will not be picking up uh, um, impulses from dorsal and ventral streams. So they have tried using dartboard stimulus instead of checkerboards and uh, studying phasic tonic aspects for VP spatial frequencies, which seem to be more specific. Orientation reversal and di uh, direction reversal stimuli can be given. And because these children get fatigued easily, you can always use expanding con and contracting concentric rings which will uh, reduce the fatigability in these children. So coming to the question, is VEP mandatory in all children? No, VEP is not mandatory in every child. If you have a good uh, PLT or a preferential looking test, which can be done on these children, and if your preferential looking is within one octave of normal for age, if your preferential looking uh, is four cycles or better, and if this preferential looking test is consistent, repeatable, responses are obtained, you don't have to go for VEP. However, it is very useful in children who have significant difficulty in visually guided behaviors like cerebral palsy and all where visuomotor dysfunction is almost always present. Another way to see it is when you do a step VEP as well as a subjective visual acuity, even if one of the tests is only partially performed, your chances of improving or getting a good measurable visual equity and predicting whether this child has good potential increases markedly. Uh, everything with a pinch of salt, also with VEP, even with cerebral blindness, sufficient quality of P1 wave may still be present. Sometimes a few spared neurons of V1 is still sufficient to generate a P1 response, but the child may see nothing. So when you get a P1 wave, all that you can tell is there is a good transmission of visually triggered retinal signals and some neuronal activity is actually present. Deep white matter lesions, migrational losses and um, can also uh, cause, can also um, give you a good wave but the child may not see anything so please be careful when you interpret CVI. So what is the role finally? Children with severe forms of CVI where you are not able to get anything at all, no vision at all, this VEP will help you assess the potential of vision where clinical tests do not give you any measured outcome where you cannot even uh, uh, finish a test, yes, it will give you an outcome. Prognosis in preterm children and children with CVI, uh, severe CVI, especially with spatial contrast, you will know if this child will have good vision. And finally, it will help you in choosing tools for intervention, the dimensions, the sizes that you have to start and the contrast that you have to start. That is something the VEP will help you with. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Saitya, for an excellent presentation. We go ahead because we are going short of time. We have Dr. Sandra Ganesh from uh, Madhur Arvind Hospital again, Coimbatore. Uh, she'll be speaking on management of strabismus in CVI children. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Suma Ganesh, uh, ma'am, for a uh, kind invitation, and I'm very happy to be a part of this uh, symposium uh, uh, today. So I'll be talking on uh, the management of uh, strabismus in uh, CVI children. Uh, so why is this so special? Because the rate of coexistence strabismus is very high among CVI children, as high as 73%, but there are no clear guidelines for the management of strabismus. And uh, most common type of strabismus that we note is exotropia, followed by esotropia and hyper. 
and also there is a tendency for the visual acuity to improve with time especially with the interventions due to the increased neuroplasticity and also there is reports that around 16% of uh, CVI patients with strabismus the alignment keeps varying and can also improve spontaneously along with the improvement in the visual acuity and other neurological functions. So that is why it makes a very difficult decision as to when uh, or if we have to operate on these patients. So treating strabismus with CVI is often challenging. There is a little data regarding the natural history of strabismus and response to surgery in children with CVI and also even post-surgery their response may differ from patients who do not have CVI. So this is a collection of patients in our uh, series uh, that we had around uh, 30 to 40 percentage of strabismus. So these are uh, just a representative example of 12 patients. Um, like uh, many of them have some systemic uh, diagnosis like cerebral palsy, genetic disorders, meningoencephalitis, late onset sepsis, uh, seizure disorders, hypoglycemia, prematurity. Um, this is just to give you an idea, I, IUGR, all of them having some ophthalmic manifestations of temporal uh, or disc pallor with uh, orthoptic evaluation uh, being a large angle esotropia or exotropia or uh, variable angles. And uh, so uh, coming to cerebral palsy and uh, CVI, it is diagnosed in almost half of the children with CVI. And this is a study which was published in uh, JAPOS in uh, 2021, where they had analyzed around uh, 151 children with uh, CVI with uh, cerebral palsy and about 153 kids with uh, CVI without cerebral palsy. And uh, they compared between the two groups. And refractive error, uh, optic atrophy, strabismus were all more common in the group with the cerebral palsy. But uh, the alignment after strabismus surgery was achieved well in the group without cerebral palsy, that is 60%, as opposed to 30% in the group who had cerebral palsy. And also on a long-term follow-up of nine years, they found that 100% of the kids who had uh, without uh, cerebral palsy achieved good outcomes, whereas none of them who uh, had cerebral palsy, uh, they did not achieve a good outcome. So uh, critical for CVI patient selection for strabismus correction will include uh, at least some visual acuity of uh, three level on the six level scale. They should be able to at least fixate and follow objects. Patients with a good control of the underlying neurological condition is paramount because we need to operate under general anesthesia. We need a good level of fitness. And patients with improving visual behavior and an angle, stable angle of strabismus has to be considered before we contemplate surgery. So how do we assess vision in these patients? We can uh, do it on a six level scale, like has been told by multiple speakers uh, before, fixation and following on a one inch toy or uh, any uh, optotype. Uh, at one foot, following a face, response to motion, response to light, no visual behavior. So this is just a, a rough way. And how do you measure the ocular alignment whenever possible? If they have good vision, we can do the alternate prism cover test. But if they are not very cooperative in angle very large and stable, we can do a Grimsky test. And standard tables are used to determine the surgical dose or we can slightly uh, uh, over or under correct as per need. So uh, we can also test the field in these patients by using a LIA van because it is said like especially in patients who have a large angle esotropia, uh, operating and correcting the alignment may help with their uh, temporal field and also their motor uh, performance. So how do we do this uh, field assessment with a simple uh, uh, the LIA band or a simple uh, gadget like this made uh, by yourself? We can test the binocular functional fields bending the band into a half circle and then keeping it from the behind, uh, we can roughly uh, get to know when the patient is able to elicit a response. So the prerequisites are that we have to select the patients based on their comorbidity and general anesthesia, stable angle of strabismus. We need to have a very good anesthesia team for smooth induction, also recovery. And also we need a thorough fitness uh, uh, documented before we plan surgery in these patients. But the limitation will also always be the measuring the binocularity post operatively, assessment of the critical period for development of normal binocularity. And also if there is any problem, it may be difficult to assess this uh, after the surgery. 
So another few uh, newer methods of documenting the visual acuity and the feel in patients with CVI include eye tracking devices, uh, which have been uh, extensively uh, studied in the United States for measurement of the visual uh, assessment capturing multiple domains of visual functioning, which can facilitate the evaluation of afferent, efferent and uh, higher order visual parameters in children with CVI. And they have used a Microsoft Surface uh, Pad with a uh, gaming software like uh, a visual tracker like the Tobey uh, Dyna and that can be attached to this with simple games played on it and then they have these uh, eye tracking trials where they can localize where the child is exactly looking based upon the heat maps where red color indicates longer fixation duration so this is a grating pattern on which uh, on the top uh, right you can see that uh, uh, most of it more than 50 percent of total fixation time is falling on the, falling on the grating so with this which you can uh, get a very good objective measurement of visual acuity which may not be very much possible if the child has multiple disabilities along with cvi and uh, this grating uh, like the below grating is uh, as you can see most of it is outside of the uh, grating so the visual acuity is less uh, in this child so these are the results of typical scans called as uh, custard pie appearance where uh, they play the game and you note the fixation patterns and for example this is a 10 year old boy with cerebral palsy following a surgical uh, successful surgery for exotropia but the parents complain that uh, the child had difficulty in walking and they cannot see where he is walking so when they tested the visual fields as you can see most of the plots are forming above the uh, uh, above the lower field so there is a lower field defect so this can confirm the family's observation that is one and secondly you can also give some interventions like you can add uh, prisms or so to help with the problem the child is facing so surgical management of strabismus in CVI is normal to that, uh, similar to that of normal patients. Uh, mostly only horizontal muscle surgeries are performed because it may be difficult to get the other angles and uh, procedure can be the weakening, strengthening or transposition as which is usually followed. So this is a study published by uh, Dr. Linda Lawrence et al. where they had studied uh, five patients uh, post abysmal surgery who had were affected by congenital Zika syndrome and uh, you can see that the preoperative visual field which was for around 45 has improved by four months and six months um, um, like around to about uh, 13 you know about 90 percent and 100 percent also and also they noted a lot of improvement in the child's social functional and behavioral improvements following the strabismus surgery with the response uh, to eye contact visual attention uh, peripheral field uh, target detection posture and socialization so this was just a very small group like five children only but uh, all of them had moderate to severe visual impairment and one four had is isotropia and one had exotropia and uh, they had a stable angle and expansion of field was there in seven eyes of four children and also the caregivers reported all 80% uh, reported improvement in daily living activities so this is the pre-op and post-op ocular alignment in four and six months after the strabismus surgery so this is another study which was published in Japos in 2016 where they had studied uh, 320 children with CVI and uh, included around 70 with strabismus uh, out of which 32 patients underwent strabismus surgery and they found less than 10 prism alignment in around 18 kids and more than 10 prism alignment in 9 kids and uh, more than uh, like 25 prism uh, which just uh, 5 kids. So why we should be doing strabismus surgery in children with CVI? Because it can improve the ocular alignment, it can expand the visual field and also improve the social, functional and behavioral skills. But uh, the major reasons to consider is expansion of the binocular uh, peripheral visual field and improvement in daily uh, functioning. But we should always remember that we should evaluate the child as a whole because most of them are uh, very uh, sick children and they have a lot of other neurological anomalies. So uh, thorough risk uh, factor explaining to the parents and then taking up for surgery would be beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for an excellent presentation. I think I would like to add when you operate for uh, esotropia in CVI, we should slightly undercorrect because otherwise they go into consecutive. So the algorithm is that you need to uh, undercorrect by around 30% when you operate for isotropia and uh, CVI. So we'll take the last and then we'll ask the question. So uh, we have uh, the next uh, talk by Dr. Laila Mohan.
He is the head of pediatric ophthalmology at Cobb Trust Eye Hospital, Kori Code, Kerala. She'll be speaking on next steps in ensuring quality of life in children with uh, CBI. So, uh, ma'am, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Suma and AIOs for giving me this opportunity. How do we go? It, it's not not moving. Is it okay? So. Uh, Next step, next steps in ensuring quality of life in children, some of the case stories. Uh, as we have already seen, it's a major cause of profound visual impairment in India too, as in the West nowadays. And it can lead to disorders of cognitive and social development like autism spectrum disorder. And so also primary neurological diseases can have ocular vision impairment too. And since they can be coexisting, it's important they have a customized approach and ev early evaluation and in management of visual disability is very important. So understanding the disability, what is the ophthalmologist's role? Each child is unique and is, be, is to be evaluated according to his visual uh, developmental deficits. And in walking disability, as in CP or in speech issues, often attention is fully given to physiotherapy and associated visual dysfunction is uh, neglected. So early visual training and rehabilitation should be instituted in a customized way. All the ways to assess uh, the visual uh, uh, disability has been described already. And visual assessment during follow-up should go hand in hand with the improvement which we see also. So let us come to some of the cases. Uh, this uh, boy, Mohammed, presented at six months with complaints of not looking at mother's face not fixing or fall he was not fixing or following and had a pvl uh, had large variable exotropia discs were pale and optic cups were large at three months or after three months of light stimulation and uh, colored object stimulation with the lia puzzles all which comes next in phase one it's mainly the light stimulation and colored objects once he starts fixing and following sometimes with a long latency. By one year, he started reaching out for objects and follow-up was done with uh, stimulating bright light, lighted objects at home also. He was given, the mother was given a questionnaire. They are given questionnaire to, to bring every two to three months to see how they are faring. And he was given an astigmatic correction of minus 2.5 cylinder in right and minus 1 in left eye. But the uh, exotropia, which was uh, alternating, become, became constant. And he was advised uh, two hours uh, occlusion of the left eye. He started watching TV. And at 5, uh, uh, during reassessment, he, uh, he was found to have accommodation lag. And bifocals were given. And uh, 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 the, the, he started looking at the pictures in the books and he was sent to Anganwadi. By 7, he was in a regular school and he plays a shuttle but uh, uh, cannot see the shuttle, when uh, the cock when he it falls down. That was the parent's complaint. His vision is 6 12 6 6 and uh, he is awaiting surgery for strabismus after. Now it's a stable uh, uh, deviation now. So, uh, he is going to regular school, little backward in studies, but he is doing well. So, uh, this girl, uh, can you stop the sound? Sound. Gauri followed up since three years of age for strabismus and global developmental delay. She was branded as having a behavioral disorder at school. And she is 16 now, attending mainstream school uh, again, not very good at studies. And she has an impaired attention, cannot concentrate on more than one thing. The mother is prompting to say, asking her to look at the uh, light, but she is not able to concentrate on that. She has apraxia of gaze and simultanagnosia and optic ataxia. This boy was being followed up from six months onwards. He was not fixing or following at presentation. Had pale discs as uh, uh, MRI showed PVL. And uh, uh, he rapidly improved from one year onwards and started going to Anganwadi by four years. And the teachers, uh, 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 Anganwadi teachers are more accessible and more attentive to these uh, children. 
the parents can go with them and uh, communicate with them and the children also can cooperate to pay attention to this this type of children and special teachers are not available in our regular mainstream schools so uh, this is a great help the mother said he was not interested in watching pictures in books OCT showed some an amount of arnafil thinning. I'm, uh, uh, I just wanted to know the panel's opinion. Uh, whether we see a lot, of, we do OCT in many of the children who cannot cooperate for uh, visual fields. So we have found many of them having superior and inferior arnafil thinning. Uh, this, he didn't have any refractive errors, no accommodation lag also, but a trial of plus lenses seemed uh, to, uh, uh, seem, uh, he seemed happy with the uh, plus lenses and we gave him plus two bifocals which he was happy to, to use at school and the class teacher said he has become more attentive and uh, reading uh, in reading and writing. After two years, he was off glasses and he goes to the regular schools. He has good vision, 6-6, six, six, uh, visual acuity. And th this child has uh, a homonymous hemianopia following a subdural hemorrhage in the left occipital area, which was evacuated. And uh, she has a face turn to compensate the same and right exotropia as also. Uh, also. Uh, there are papers saying uh, exotropia can, constant uh, unilateral exotropia can occur in the towards the side of homonym, homonymous hemianopia as a compensatory measure. And grasping things in the blind area to relearn uh, can be encouraged utilizing this blind sight. She, she had improved a lot in her uh, at least functional vision in that area, where, which, uh, uh, which can widen their activities in this field. And she had surgery for uh, exotropia later. Uh, so all these we have seen are... Uh, high functioning CVI where they can be uh, they can go to attend the mainstream schools this girl Khadija was not fixing and following till three years and she had walking disability attending a physiotherapy department she had uh, can, can you put off the volume of the she she had walking disability and she started fixing and following with the light stimulation and she started reaching out for objects, which was a market change, improving the communication with the mother. And the family members also could interact more, which uh, by which she became more manageable at home. And often vision improves contrary to our expectations. She had a very large uh, gliotic, uh, a she had gliotic areas in the parietal and occipital areas with extensive cerebral injury. Also, sometimes it's possible to improve their uh, functional vision so she uses touch and smell to see what is the object and some amount of blind sight is there we can encourage this uh, in children so ocular vision impairment uh, we have already seen refractive errors accommodation lag strabismus congenital cataract all these can happen coexist with cvi and this boy, uh, he is 21 now, was operated for congenital cataract at three months. He had microphthalmia, was not fixing or following light after cataract surgery also. And MRI showed PVL. And with light stimulation and educating the parents, during each visit, you have to insist wearing FAQ glasses. That is the most important thing because he is not looking at light. They are not very keen in wearing glasses. So this is also difficult to manage during the post-op period. So he has still some problem with speech and walking, uh, but he has 6 to 24 vision and he is working in a shop now. So the, is it intellectual disability or uh, CVI and cataract? So this boy was branded as intellectually backward and aggressive behavior. He was unmanageable at home and he they placed him in an orphanage. And cataract was diagnosed much later and IOL surgery was done at the age of seven. And his immediate post-op period was poor and MRI showed that he had periventricular leukomalacia in the parietal areas. And after a few weeks of training, he started looking at the light, at lights and watching TV later. Strabismus, we don't have to uh, discuss more, I think, extensively. It has been already discussed. Uh, so how do we go about it after a period of light stimulation and uh, uh, after improvement with bright objects and colored objects? The seeing, seeing area has to be identified and adapt his environment 
so that he will not bump into places. Highlight contrast of door edges, staircases, steps, the last step especially, the room table to be should be clutter free as we have already seen. And light box activities, uh, uh, any activity can be done on his light box and uh, in, enhance his visual field by touch, color and smell, which can be, these are the other senses which can be utilized for him to identify the objects and show appreciation when a task is done. So as he grows older, when he can attend school or even teach him, uh, uh, refractive correction has to be given and uh, uh, prisms and field defects, mobility in classroom, he should be uh, uh, placed in a place where we identify the field defect and where he can look at the teacher. If he has a lower field defect, let, the, let him sit at a lower chair and they love to have their own places, their own chairs also. So in large field defects, we have uh, cane training has to be done. Uh, uh, you, we all know how Tiffany Brar has uh, is mobilized uh, 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 without any other. Uh, she came all alone in a public transportation. That was uh, we have seen how she came yesterday. It's important for the mother to understand that along with field stimulation, child child should be encouraged to sit, walk. Uh, in a walker, uh, sit and uh, use the walker at the proper appropriate time so that their motor development also occurs simultaneously. We should not ne neglect that till vision improves. Otherwise, uh, their motor uh, tone will reduce. And the cross disability collaboration is important because, uh, as we have seen, there are not a lot of neurological associations. So, as soon as possible, we have to refer them to the uh, neurologist or uh, rehabilitation centers. So in Down syndrome, 30% uh, of them have CVI, so, uh, and they have a very high incidence of accommodation lag also, uh, as we have seen. So they should be given corrective glasses, corrective uh, plus lenses for near vision and correction of uh, strabismus uh, and training for vision. So customized care, uh, educating the mother, and shadow teachers, which all cannot avail. Uh, 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 so the mother, parent or mother is the most important uh, factor who can communicate with the uh, child and the teachers also. Shadow teachers can help, uh, but uh, I've seen many mothers become shadow teachers to their own children and they encourage other children also. They go to school uh, in a, when they go start going to the mainstream or even Anganwadi. So both special school and mainstream can occur simultaneously. So that's done. So interactive online apps which are available, we should make parents aware of them. And it should be a holistic approach to any type of CVA with, with the pediatric uh, neurologist, ophthalmologist, ortho, rehabilitation specialist, and occupational therapist which uh, who can help. And early diagnosis is very important and early intervention. It's a lifelong follow-up. Our aim is to enhance the residual vision so that other neurodevelopmental functions also are facilitated and appropriate counseling and referral to other specialities. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for an excellent presentation. I'm sorry to have exceeded the time. Ooh, Dr. Aditya is uh, IC. Dr. Jitendra. Uh, we are, we are giving the stage now. <laughs> Thank you all for your participation and uh, for your attention. Thank you so much.